All right, let's get started. The two more common issues that an underwriter is going to run into, and I've kind of lumped these or put them in order that maybe are the most common that the underwriter might see. There's, it could be any combination of these things we're looking at. Obviously, the deed we spoke about a minute ago is going to be prevalent in, in all conveyance because that is the mechanism of conveyance. So there's always going to be a deed in every conveyance, even if it's just a cash sale, all right? Um, these, two, these next two I've kind of lumped together because they're kind of common in that may be seen by an underwriter, so they have to be special careful of those. They are foreclosures and potential bankruptcies, all right? So a foreclosure, when a lien creditor i.e. the lender, has to satisfy the debt that's owed. The owner of the property got behind on the, didn't make the payments, forced a foreclosure. They have to resort to a sale of the liened property through the process. Most states, including Indiana, Florida, uh, Oklahoma, require that it go to the share sale to satisfy that debt. The property rights of the debtor which is the lien holder, and potentially any other junior liens could get wiped out or extinguished. So those could still show even though a person went through foreclosure. So if that person that bought it out of the sheriff's sale, let's say, now goes to sell the property, there, those old junior liens that were technically extinguished in a foreclosure may still show on the chain of title. So there has to be some work done by that underwriter to get those technically released uh, in order to make sure that any subsequent title can be satisfied, all right? And they can do, they have, so they have two kind of responsibilities. They have to make sure that all the statutory and contractual requirements of the process that was completed was done correctly so that none of those junior lien holders could try and undo or overturn that sheriff sale. And if there is a state, Indiana is not one of them, by the way, Arizona has redemption, and they have to make sure that they are not within that right of redemption period for the state that used that redemption period. Now, in Indiana, if you're listening to this in Indiana, um, and we're standing in Indiana for you guys here, but for you out there listening, um, Indiana does not practice the statutory right of redemption for foreclosure, all right? You always got to add that last little bit for foreclosure because Indiana does have a statutory right of redemption for taxes. We are not talking about taxes right now. We are talking about foreclosures. So they have to make sure if the underwriter is in a state that allows a right of redemption, say such as Arizona, that that property cannot be sold in that statutory period because the one that got foreclosed upon, the grantor or the seller or whatever you want to call that person, still may have the right for 365 days to come back and redeem that foreclosure sale. So they have to make sure, the underwriter, the underwriter has to make sure that they are not within that statutory time frame as well. All right, so you see the issues? Yeah, question? Uh, I'll, I'll repeat the question for those at home because I can barely hear you. No, the question was, does, <laughs> David, you asked the question. <laughs> if you put your phone down, you might hear this good class. <laughs> the question was, does Indiana use that? No, Indiana doesn't use the statutory right of redemption. Now, remember, we have the equitable right of redemption. That is before the foreclosure. Somebody can walk in and say, hey, how much do I owe? I'm being foreclosed upon. I hit the lottery last night. My court case is next week. 
but I've got the entire money right now. I want to quote unquote pay my loan off, take me out of foreclosure. That's called the equitable right of redemption. Equitable meaning fair or money. And that's what you owe money is fair to pay off. So it's called the equitable right of redemption. After the foreclosure court date, there is a time frame some states use called a statutory right of redemption. Statutory is a state law. Indiana does not exercise the statutory right of redemption for foreclosure cases. All right, make sure you understand that because Indiana does exercise the statutory right of redemption for a tax lien sale, all right? So for the real estate taxes and the house goes into the tax sale, that person living in the house has 365 days to pay the back taxes plus a penalty to reclaim or redeem their house. In the foreclosure world, we do not practice that, all right? Now, <clears throat> a second common item that the uh, underwriter may run into is bankruptcies. Bankruptcies. Now, when a property gets transferred, and I told you earlier, the deed gets recorded in the county that the property's in. If that county also includes the bankruptcy court, most underwriters will go ahead and run a bankruptcy search in that county because they are quote unquote already there. All right, finger quotes. They're already there. They're down there. Now that could be in person or it could be on records uh, online now probably. Um, they're already in and have access. They can search for a bankruptcy in that court. If the property is in a different county than the bankruptcy court is, typically underwriters don't run a bankruptcy search for the grantor because they would have to go to another county court records to search that out. Unless the underwriter is of belief that they are in bankruptcy. And that belief may come through from the real estate people. When the house is being sold and being marketed as a short sale, they're in bankruptcy, things like that might trigger the underwriter to go, oh, well, this house is in bankruptcy because that's how it's sold, okay? Another key for a great educated underwriter, and I've spoke to several that have done this, not so common now, but in 08, 09, very common. If they saw a purchase price that was less than the lien amount, they would quickly assume in that, in those days, back in those days, <laughs> for us old people, they would go, oh, this is probably a short sale. So they might run a bankruptcy or check to see if the person was in bankruptcy. So they don't typically do it unless they know they do it or, or know for some reason. So you've got two scenarios. Let me recap in case I wasn't clear. If the property's in the county where the court is, they'll run, typically run a bankruptcy search anyway. If the property's not in the same county, they won't run that bankruptcy search unless they have been told to or they have some reason to believe that this is a bankruptcy. Like I said, the example I gave, purchase price less than uh, the outstanding lien. So if these matters, either the foreclosure or the bankruptcy show up, they have, these are things that would require the underwriter to do further search and investigation into the courts to make sure everything was done properly. We're past the redemption period. We've decided if they're going to uh, reavow on the property, or are they going to let it go? All of these things have to be searched by the underwriter for these two common items, all right? We're gonna take a break, uh, be right back. Uh, for those of you at home, stick around. We're gonna talk about some other issues the underwriter may see. I'm Raymond Modulin. If you have questions, feel free to email me, raymond at realuniversity.com 
Hold on. 